I think it just clicked in my head of like, nobody's doing this. Like nobody's sprinting, you know, and it just became this conversation around coaching, which is like, are you guys doing full speed sprinting? Like I've, I haven't seen that in, in college football or many collegiate sports at all. Everything is just conditioning that like I talked about before, everything is that physiological driven uh, volume based training instead of let's push the upper limits of, of uh, power and speed. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one resource for all things fitness and performance in Switzerland. Today, I'm happy to welcome on the podcast, Cameron Joss, athletic performance coach for football at Indiana University. Cam, thanks for accepting my invitation. Hey, thanks, Sean. I appreciate you reaching out and I'm excited to be here. You've got a great show and I've listened to a lot of great guests that you've had on there. So I'm excited and, and honored to be here. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. So for, for those who don't know you yet, can you talk a little bit about you, who you are, what you do, and a bit of your background as well? Sure. Yeah. Currently, I'm, well, I guess the official title would be athletic performance coach for football. Uh, basically, I'm an assistant strength coach at Indiana University here in the U.S. and working specifically with American football. And uh, I, I come to Indiana after having spent about seven, eight years in the private sector, working at DeFranco's training systems in mm -hmm. New Jersey, uh, couple, spent a couple of years in Austin, Texas, and basically just wanted to make the transition from the private sector to the team setting. So I had the opportunity to come here with our director, uh, Aaron Wellman, who came from the New York Giants. So he's got a whole wealth of experience and had the opportunity to meet him in New Jersey. And this came up where he was coming here and he gave me a call and I accepted and, and I couldn't be happier to be here with him and the rest of our performance staff. Awesome. Can you talk a little bit about that transition from, you know, you spent quite a few years in the private sector, like you said, at DeFranco's. So what have been for you in your mind, the kind of the upsides of and the downsides of, of each one of those experiences, uh, one uh, in the private sector and the one you're now? Yeah, well, first, the, the, the biggest advantage of being in the private sector for me was the hands-on coaching that I was able to do and the interpersonal connection that you would have with each client that comes in. Uh, so for me, that was basically my opportunity to try out really whatever I wanted to try out. And the constraints were really time was the only constraint in terms of what I wanted to do, the creative process of it. There, there were almost no constraints other than possibly equipment constraints and, you know, maybe finding some field space, but basically, however, I wanted to design the workouts. There was, there was no other competing factors. You know, these athletes were coming to me in the off season. They were not in season. Sometimes they were, you know, depending on the sport that I was working with, but just the opportunity to work with so many different sport populations from and with people from all over the world and just learning and building experience understanding sport generalities you know just the mm. the commonalities the underlying factors that apply to athletes of different disciplines and so for, for me that was just a, a really great experience to have that lab-like setting where i could really learn uh just from a performance standpoint i could take what i was reading and researching and hearing from other coaches and apply it and see how it would work in my setting and pay attention to the adaptations that were taking place and pay special attention to my testing and, and the results that were being seen. Whereas now I am in a setting where there are so many other factors and constraints involved because now, you know, I went from just having me and, and my small groups in the private sector to now I'm a part of really an entire team that's not just limited to the team of athletes that I work with, but being a part of a performance team, being a part of an entire coaching staff that has to work in conjunction with a nutrition staff, you know, a sports medicine staff, a, psych a psychology staff, a sports psychology staff. So we, we have all these different uh, just disciplines within our own team and, and we have to cross pollinate and, and communicate. And these were the challenges that I wanted to bring to myself was just how can I take what I learned in the private sector keep that with me but now i want to learn about all these other factors and the biggest transition for me was was just really learning how to build a culture at one team mm -hmm. uh, certainly there's a culture in the private sector but in the private sector people are paying you to come and 
work out at your facility. So they are usually fairly motivated unless their their parents or somebody is, is funding it for them and they're kind of making them go. But usually everybody's very highly motivated on a daily basis in the private sector when they come to work out. Whereas in, in a team setting, you're seeing these athletes every single day, whether or not they really want to be interacting and based on all of their lifestyle factors and, and the stresses they're dealing with from being student athletes and just, you know, being, being kids in their twenties and, uh, you know, late, late teens and twenties and just trying to figure out their life stresses at the same time. And how does that all then impact what we're able to do from a training standpoint? So it's, it's very fascinating. What have you found out so far in that kind of pursuit of, of you know, uh, different challenges in your career, that, that team culture aspect, uh, what are the, what are the main components of it that you've been able to, to kind of spot so far, you know, being immersed in that environment now and what are the hardest things to change about that culture? Well, first and foremost, it was really easy for me to possibly observe people that were working in this setting and, and be critical of them. It's always easy to do that until you're actually in the scenario and you have to deal with it yourself. So uh, early in my career, I was guilty of that. I was critical of, you know, collegiate strength coaches or professional strength coaches that were dealing with teams. And I had no idea what that context was like. The closest thing I'd gotten to that was an internship, you know, back in 2013 where I was in a collegiate setting for maybe six months. And then the other experience was working with a high school team for one season off season and then through the season other than that i didn't have a, a great idea of what it was like so for for me to think that i was able to criticize some of these people it was just uh in poor taste to, to be honest and anybody else I, i would i would say that it's until you're in it you don't quite understand it it's just the way that it is and so um a lot of the challenges that we see is just you know you have to like I said, in the private sector, everybody's coming with a, a fair amount of motivation and they're all fairly similarly minded because they're all people that are searching for a place to train and get better. And they have, they have very common uh, goals for the most part. Uh, whereas here you, you just, some kids are, you just don't know their background. You learn about all different kinds of, of people just like you would in the private sector. But the difference is that here they're all interacting on one team and they all have to cooperate together in order to be successful. And so we have to learn how to cooperate with players of all different personalities and coaches of all different personalities. And how do we communicate and be effective and find ways to succeed, not just in training, but also in the sport, because something that our, our staff is dedicated to is not just getting better testing numbers and improving our performance metrics or, or whatever data we might be collecting, but For us, we want to win our conference. We want to build this program into something it's never been before because historically it's not a great American football program. Uh, just they've, they haven't had much winning success in this program, historically speaking. And that, and that goes all the way back really from the inception of the program. They were very good in the 1940s, <laughs> you know, but uh, it's been, there's been decades and decades of just kind of being in the middle or possibly on the lower end. And so we want to make this program the best it's ever been. And so we're dedicated to that and, and uh, just trying to find all the different ways that we can get through to these players, to these coaches, and, and all learn how to slowly chip away at it so we can all speak the same language mm -hmm. and start to get some results in a positive direction. How has the dynamic changed for you in terms of kind of the boundaries that you have to operate within? Because in the private sector, like you said, you can do – whatever you want. If you want a ball in there, if you want to, you know, do some really specific stuff, you can, you have the liberty to do it. And, and now from what my understanding is that it's, it's different. You have your field, kind of your field of, uh, you know, applicability, if you want to talk like that. And then there's the skills coaches that take care of the other part. And then, you know, like you said, many other staff that interact with the team in order to get them to their top potential. How has it been for you that transition from, you know, like you said before, being able to test everything that you want and being able to integrate a lot of maybe specific stuff into the training to kind of, you know, getting back in your lane, quote unquote. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question and a great, point to bring up because especially this year with COVID-19 it's mm -hmm. been the weirdest transition that could have ever been imagined uh, you know I'm sure and so I had my preconceived ideas of how it was going to be and that was before COVID even happened so <laughs> there was well upon that happening the constraints just went through the roof so yeah I, I mean I'm I'm still in the process of trying to comprehend and learn all of the differences between what's allowed and what's not, you know, from a compliance standpoint, what, what time of the year we're allowed to do certain things versus others, 
and uh, you know the coaching involvement and how how does that impact what we're doing in terms of uh, you know they are going to be influencing the players if they are allowed to have more hours with them in terms of the technical tactical preparation and so how does that influence what we're doing from a physical preparation standpoint and so um, yeah I mean this year was just this year was very challenging in terms of abiding by the, the, the rules of just health, you know, just being able to keep players in specific cohorts, knowing which cohorts we're going to work with, which coaches, you know, we, our performance staff, we split up the entire roster into these different cohorts. And so we, we actually didn't get to really work together as a performance staff when we first got here, you know, mm-hmm. we, we were talking and uh, we were designing the training and we were implementing it, but we, I didn't get to coach with another coach next to me. It was like, I had, so for me, I was kind of used to that come from the private sector, but I know uh, it was just, it was very different and strange for, for all of us to say, well, we can't even coach on the floor together because we have to have these very specific cohorts and make sure we're social distancing and all of that. And so um, as we've advanced our ability to test with our athletes uh, going forward and, and which is now allowing us to play a season, you know, we've been able to sort of uh, integrate the cohorts a little bit more. So we're, we have more coaches on the floor and more players in, in the room. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's always, there's always the, the same constraints you would have anywhere else of, of, you know, maybe we only have 45 minutes to get them through a workout. So how do we maximize that 45 minutes to the, to the, to the greatest degree that we can? And then how are we interacting with the coaches to understand all the stressors that are going on with these players? Because we are certainly of the mindset that we do not exist in a vacuum. Our training is not isolated to, you know, just by itself. It, it interacts with everything. And so, uh, you know, our, our head strength coach, Aaron Wallman, he's, he's got his PhD. He's, very, he's incredibly intelligent. He, this, this guy, and his, if he has any spare moment, he's reading research papers, he's connecting with coaches, he's learning everything that he possibly can. And the, it trickles down to the rest of us from the top down. And so we're always trying to just gain a better understanding of, what's going on like what's happening in reality and how do we help prepare our players in the safest and most efficient way possible and we get it wrong all the time you know we're not afraid to say that and uh, but we're our constant pursuit is to get a little bit better every day and that's what we try to do what are some of the systems that you guys have put in place in order to track that that load that you know global load management kind of aspect of things so that like you said even when the players go from technical tactical to, to physical, even maybe uh, in the rehab setting for some, for some, uh, trying to take all these factors into account so that obviously, like you said, from a health standpoint, we want to put that first and uh, whether it's for COVID or, you know, just in the performance uh, realm, we want the, ki- the kids, we want the guys to be fit and healthy so that they can, you know, play all year, uh, every game, every practice. So how do you kind of manage all of this together? Yeah, I would say right now we are, we were thrown into the fire with all this stuff so where we had a lot of ideas of what we wanted to do when we were talking about getting together as a staff because we, we just got to Indiana in March, all of us, mm-hmm. uh, including Aaron Wellman. And so we had these ideas of things that we were thinking of trying to do. And then it just became COVID-19, all this crazy chaos is happening. So we, we've literally been like trying to put out the fires as they come up. Like we're, we're and that's just the truth. Like we're, we're in a crazy chaotic situation right now. And we're just, uh, you know, we have one of our other performance coaches, Justin Collette, he always says knees bent, you know, <laughs> don't, you're always ready to redirect and, and change direction where you need to. And so uh, that's, that's how we're operating. So some of the things that we've, that we have been able to do, which has been great is we've, we've gotten uh, GPS units. We've gotten catapult. We've been able to start monitoring load as, as so we had a little bit of practice over the summer where we thought we were going to have a summer training camp and then, the big 10 conference ended up postponing their season. Mm. So we ended up kind of getting back into an off season mode. It was just this crazy back and forth and this crazy seesaw. So yeah, definitely knees bent all the time. And, uh, but we had already started to utilize the catapult and start seeing some of the, the loading that was happening with these coaches and how they would organize practice. And so now what we're doing is we're just trying to uh, get an idea of how the practice is being structured. And we're trying to work with our uh football coaches to ensure that we don't have the highest loads immediately at the beginning. Like we make a mm-hmm. gradual progression over time. And we've been able to do that very successfully so far in the first couple of weeks here. And our coaches are amazing. Our, our, our head coach, Tom Allen and, and the rest of his coaching staff, like they are just, they're phenomenal in terms of how they're so willing to ask questions and work with us. And we, we really couldn't be any more fortunate to, 
to have better coaches than we have in terms of their ability to work with us and have these conversations. So that, that's the big one, obviously, in terms of monitoring practice loads. And um, on top of that, you know, we're subjectively, we're talking to the players a lot, trying to understand how they're feeling, how they're doing. And because it's, it's tough, too, from a subjective standpoint, because we are still trying to get to know these players. Like I said, mm-hmm. we just got here and we're still trying to get to know them as people. And a lot of times we haven't been around certain players for too long versus other coaches might have been because of these cohorts that we were training in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but outside of that, we, you know, we monitor their strength numbers. We're monitoring uh, force plate data. We're utilizing that. We, uh, we've been doing, we did some 1080 sprint work. We have a 1080 sprint machine here. Nice. So we were able to monitor some force velocity profiling with them. Uh, but, you know, over, over the, the summer leading into this in-season mode, we were able to do that. And luckily, we were actually able to perform some video analysis in terms of their, their movement and their sprinting. We did some basic, just basic drills. We did, you know, some, some linear sprinting, a basic 5-10-5, uh, 20-yard shuttle drill. And we just filmed them just to see how these guys are moving and we can go back and review. And so we, we just try to hit it wherever we can. You know, we're just – and we're working in conjunction with sports medicine who they have their own analyses that they're using. And we're just, we're trying to bridge everybody together. You know, it's a, it's a process that we're building right now. And so uh, if you ask me a year from now, everything we have in place, it'll be a much better, much bigger answer. But right now I can just tell you, we're, we're trying to build it as we go. I'll, uh, I'll definitely have you, I'll definitely have you back on to, to go back on all those things. Once, you know, things calm down and everything's in place. I want to come back to the sprinting. I want to t- come back to the testing. I want to come back to the videoing, but before that, if we can go back to your previous experience in the private sector, you, you talked about, you know, testing workouts and protocols, see what works, see what doesn't in that realm, you know, off the top of your head, what are some of the protocols that maybe you didn't think would work that well that has the that had the best outcomes and then on the other side uh things that you thought were going to be fantastic and then didn't really pan out as you thought that they would yeah i i used to be of the mindset of just a ton of volume you know more is better approach and yeah i I just i came from studying strength training by itself and then that branched into let me understand some stuff about power and then let me try to understand some stuff about sprinting and i was very i guess physiologically driven early on in my in my coaching education my my self-education i should say the things i was looking into was just Mm -hmm. trying to understand how to be this physiological powerhouse so volume was a big factor that i was focusing on early on and then as i evolved i started shifting a little bit more towards understanding skill acquisition, motor control, and and really building uh, effective movers. And it's not just biomechanically efficient movers, but also how how to help athletes make more effective decisions uh, in terms of how they respond to their environment and and that side of it. So for me, uh, I guess going down that, that, that later route led me to try to understand more pedagogical ideas, how to actually coach and and teach and facilitate learning for these athletes. And so um, some of the things I used to do were I would try to do a lot of the, you know, biofeedback type stuff where you keep repping until you drop, you know, below 5%. You have a five percent drop off or something in, in your mm-hmm. your bar speed or your jump height. You know, I would do a lot of things like that because I was always like, yeah, let's continue to build this capacity and this 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 physiological powerhouse. And obviously, there's still some tremendous benefit to doing training like that, especially with some of our uh, younger athletes that don't that just don't understand work capacity yet. And we're trying to build that. So, but I I lived in that zone where it was just volume, volume, volume. And, uh, eventually I transitioned into realizing that if I can do a a minimal volume and still get the effect that I want, that's likely more desirable because Mm -hmm. then I'm leaving the athlete with more current adaptation reserves, right? Uh, going back all the way to reading super training back in the day, just, just having them be allowing them to have some more energy to adapt to other things outside of what they're doing with me. Mm. And even in the private sector, some of these athletes were, were working with a skills coach on the side, you know, maybe they're in American football and they have a, an offensive line coach that they go see later that night or something like that. So that, that would still interplay with what I was doing. And plus I just don't even know what else they're doing all day anyway. So, uh, but that, that's where I shifted more towards, okay, 
can I focus more on the qualitative side of things versus just purely quantitative? Mm -hmm. And then if I can keep quality high, let me see what kind of volumes I can do within that. And so everything shifted more towards a qualitative approach. And that, that kind of coincided with my shift towards trying to understand speed and building high speed performance and high power performance, because, you know, the research will tell you, and even just practical experience will tell you that, uh, it's to operate at the, the highest level of speed and power. It takes a, it takes very high quality and you, you have to allow the athlete to, uh, have a minimal volume that allows them to stay in that high quality environment. So yeah, I've kind of been on both sides of the fence and, uh, but I, I will always now, I just shift more towards, yeah, everybody says at the minimal effective dose, but I truly try to understand what that is. You know, if, if I don't need to go much more than this, and this year is probably the most educating for that is like, especially when we started football practice and uh, talking with the coaches, we, we had that conversation with them and, 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 you know, and Aaron Wellman had that conversation with our head coach of let's, let's slowly build this out. Let's try to get this right and see, you know, what can we do and still get the effect that we want instead of just hammer them, hammer them, hammer them if we don't need to do that, you know, but obviously still building out, the necessary minimum threshold of volume that we will need. Uh, so that's always important because you, you can obviously do too little and then not be prepared as well. So yeah, that's kind of vague, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's kind of where my mindset has been shifting back and forth over the years. When was there like an aha moment for you when you really realized the importance uh, that speed development had for a field sport athlete, or was it kind of a gradual process over time? I think there was kind of an aha moment and I was, I was pretty young in my coaching where I think I just realized that when I came out of playing college football myself, I realized that I went through four years of training and playing this sport at the collegiate level where I didn't do a full speed sprint once, you know, unless I was like chasing somebody in practice or whatever, but in training, you know, it was, fairly common with what everybody else was doing around the country, which was you warm up and then you go to the weight room. Like there was the only time you would go to the field is for conditioning runs, like highly intense aerobic work or lactic work. Uh, but in terms of that true high quality speed training that I was just talking about before, really allowing athletes to get 90 plus percent of their maximum speed, it just wasn't happening uh, back then. And so for me, when I got into coaching at a young age, I, I was shown Charlie Francis, right? That was like people started turning to that. And it, he had been around for, for many years, of course. But uh, it was when it was really starting to pick up and be trendy. It was just, hey, read this guy, Charlie Francis. He's been around for, you know, a, a, little, a little while now. And uh, he's got these books out that are fairly easy to comprehend. And so uh, diving into that a little bit and – it's, it, I think it just clicked in my head of like, nobody's doing this. Like nobody's sprinting, you know, and it just became this conversation around coaching, which is like, are you guys doing full speed sprinting? Like I've, I haven't seen that in, in college football or many collegiate sports at all. I mean, everything is just conditioning that like I talked about before, everything is that physiological driven uh, volume based training instead of let's push the upper limits of, of uh, power and speed. And so I'm grateful that I was, I was shown, that stuff early on because I, it allowed me to take many years to continue to dive into doing that. And I made all the mistakes of trying to implement speed training, you know, because I didn't, I just didn't have an appreciation for how intense sprinting really is. And I also didn't have any appreciation for how important the biomechanics of sprinting are. And that's something that people like to argue about still to this day. But I, I do all the speed training I implement with our players. I do it myself. Like I feel it myself. And, um, I, I just totally feel the difference by doing things correctly versus, or quote unquote correctly, I should say, more biomechanically efficiently uh, versus just going full speed however I feel like it. And um, I, I just, I made that just something that was very, I was very driven to learn all of that simply because I realized the importance of it. And I also realized that it was going to be a way to help my athletes separate themselves because not too many of other people were doing it and not too many people were willing to do the work to understand it. And so now it's a different story. People are really trying to understand it a lot more, which is amazing. It's awesome. It's great. It's going to benefit all of our players across the country and every sport. Um, 
but yeah, I, I think that it was an aha moment for me of just, this is important and nobody's doing it. And this is a way for my guys to separate themselves or my girls to separate themselves, you know? So <laughs> that's where I, I dove into it at first. How has your thinking kind of evolved uh, on this topic of speed development since you first, you know, discovered it until today? What were the kind of the big stepping stones for you in terms of maybe understanding it in your mind, structuring it? How do you break it down? Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, I used to see it as the base of your program is the lifting, the resistance training, and then you sprinkle in some sprint training. You slowly work on that right and, and basically as the years went on i became uh, i i gained more and more uh of a respect for including the field to some degree on most days of training if not every day of training and i also started to understand that you know charlie francis is very well known for basically having two zones of training you know 95 or higher 90 and higher for maximum effort speed training, uh, max intensity speed training, or you go 75% or lower for your aerobic work and, and basically nothing in between. And so I was operating in that from that framework as well for a while. And basically over time talking with more track and field people and, and especially all the folks at, at Altus, you know, and talking with Stu McMillan in particular about just having an appreciation for all the, for various zones of speed and how, you know, the, their new need for speed course that just came out is incredible because they talk about all of the factors that they believe go into really enhancing a team sport player's ability to be fast in the game. And I mean, looking at what everything they've covered, I don't know of anything else that they <laughs> missed out, missed out on touching upon, but um, they have various speed zones. You know, they talk about, really five or six different speed zones that are everything from really low speeds to very high fast sprinting because a team sport athlete needs to be effective and efficient in all of these different zones. And they all feel a little bit different, you know, the way that they actually feel the experience of them. So I think that's where talking with these coaches, I've, I've, I've gained a much more respect for the experience of the athlete. You know, what is it that they're actually feeling? It's not just numbers. You know, I can't just say, all right, if I'm above 90%, I'm good. Or if I'm below 75%, like, yeah, those are there to help guide what we're trying to do. But there's still this component of skill acquisition involved. And part of that skill acquisition involves the athlete's psychology and their ability to perceive things and understand things and their cognition. So, um, and their emotions are tied into all of that. And so I want to know how can I help an athlete have a certain experience that allows them to heighten their ability to perform. And when it comes to the speed training and gaining a better appreciation for the form, the technique, the, the principles underlying effective sprinting, efficient movement uh, from a biomechanical standpoint, a lot of times I've had athletes say, wow, that just feels athletic when I do it. That just feels better than whatever I was doing. I feel smoother. You know, it's not necessarily, maybe their numbers don't change either. Like, you know, you time them on a 20 yard sprint, maybe it's right about the same, but their experience is totally different because now they're saying, I feel so much more efficient. I feel so much better. I feel like I'm not using as much energy. So in my mind, you just improve speed performance, even though the time doesn't show a difference because now they're costing themselves less energy when they're performing at higher speeds. So that's going to help them in their game. And psychologically, it's going to help them be more confident in their own speed ability. So we try to get them to understand these things first. And then once those are in place and it always it always exists in harmony with trying to get the time to be faster of course and the speed itself to be higher uh, but i really try to focus a lot on that experience side first and once that's in place so i know i i now know what you expect from me is you know this would be the athlete talking i know what you expect from me i understand what's going on i i know what a good position feels like great awesome now let's just try to get you to run as fast as you can you know let's, let's continue to hammer away at these things and and then it becomes about knowing when to push them and, and pull them back based upon what's happening because if they know what's going on and they, and they know what they should be feeling and they're still having a weird day, you pull them back. And then if they're, if they're really doing awesome and they feel great and they're like, I'm going to break a personal record today, great, let's do it. You know? And then so it's just always understanding that, that intricate balance of how to push and how to, how to pull guys back and, and, and do so in a way that they understand that they are still training hard all the time. It's always good effort from a mental standpoint, but it's just being smart about it too. 
I've got a couple of follow-ups on, on that really good point that you just made. First of all, how do you, in, in, in a world that's in the world that we live in, the performance world that's driven by numbers, how do you get the guys and the gals to understand that qualitative aspect of sprinting without taking away from, you know, the, the importance of the, the numbers, obviously, but like you said, it's a kind of a two pronged approach and you need both. You can't just focus on the one. So how do you make that transition? I guess that might come back to the culture point previously a little bit as well. And then the second follow up would be, how do you get, <clears throat> sorry, how do you get your athletes to be in touch with how they're feeling without making it too kind of brainy, if I can put it that way, without getting them to think too much, because we know that when we want them to, to move well and move fast, it has to be, there has to be that instinctive almost uh, aspect to it where you don't want to just think about everything that you're doing too much. So how do you kind of reconcile those, those sides? Yeah, I'm glad you brought both of those up because for one, uh, when it comes to collecting data, we certainly are doing that, right? It's, uh, I would never be one to say that we don't take numbers. And, but the thing about when, when I, when I just see numbers on a page to me, that's quantitative analysis. Like mm -hmm. that's just, that's giving me some part of the picture, but not the whole picture. So uh, I need to understand some kind of calls qualitative assessment of what, what these numbers are portraying. You know, you get a, say you have an athlete jump on a force plate and you get the numbers. You know, oh, this guy has a, 20% imbalance, you know, he's using his right leg 20% more than his left. Okay, great. But what does that really tell me other than just, just simply that <laughs> like there's an imbalance, but if I were to take a video analysis of slow motion and then compare it to that, I now have both. I have a qualitative assessment and I have the number to show, Oh, well look at what's happening with his right knee or his left knee, you know, whatever he's, he's completely leaning left. He's pushing off things like that. Then you can show the athlete that video too. Hey, look at what you're doing. Are you aware that you're doing that? Like, oh no, I had no idea I was doing that. Okay, yeah, well, now that look at, look at what it's doing to the number that's showing up here, right? And so uh, the same thing with sprinting is, you know, the 1080 sprint, obviously this incredible machine gives you an incredible amount of data and there's so many different data points that you can look at. But even with that, we have to film the sprint mm -hmm. because if it's showing a certain trend, Sometimes we can just immediately, we can look at this athlete sprint at the same time and say that that is perfectly portraying what we're seeing on here. You know, this guy's a very heavy, uh, he, he's, he's so force dominant. Well, look, he's like really overreaching and trying to stay on the ground longer because he doesn't have great elastic ability and it's showing up in this video, right? And then you can show the athlete that in conjunction with showing the athlete video of some of the best sprinters in the world. Hey, look, look at what they're doing in terms of some of these principles that we're talking about, right? This, you know, some of the things we talk about as they're approaching higher speeds would be like, you know, you want to bounce off the ground. You don't want to just like stomp your feet. It's not about like trying to actively aggressively, like just punch the ground as hard as you can. It's about putting effective force on the ground. So it's going to be high, obviously, if you were to measure it, but it's about being smooth with it being bouncy, being springy as you're approaching these higher speeds and you're entering more of an elastic environment. So uh, we show them what a high level sprint looks like in that transition point. And then we show them what they look like, <laughs> you know, and we compare the two and I, and I, I'll make, you know, kinograms of all of our guys and I bring mm -hmm. them in to our office and I show them, I say, this is, this is Christian Coleman, the, the 60 meter world record holder, the best accelerator on the planet in terms of short distance. Look at his first three steps. Look at your first three steps. You know, look at the trends of what we're seeing with him versus what we're seeing with you. And what we see with a lot of our guys are things like they get too big and they stay too big, you know, in terms of like their thigh separation, they're overstriding, they're casting out with the foot. Uh, whereas Christian Coleman or any other high level sprinter will expand really big in the push and then they'll contract quickly into the next step. So their, their thighs separate really big and then they come together quickly up, uh, upon touching the ground into the next step. Hmm. So, we have other guys that do the opposite. They stay little all the time. They never expand, right? And so you start to see how the data that's coming out of the machine or the times that we're measuring are coinciding with what we're seeing visually and qualitatively as well. So to me, that's where they get more buy-in from that because most athletes in team sport are used to looking at film, used to looking at video. You know, that's how they've learned because that's how coaches coach them. 
is, you know, look at where your position is here. You should be more doing this. This would be more effective. So we do the same thing. We just attack their brain from the same standpoint to help them try to comprehend what we're trying to talk about. So we have basically film study for strength and conditioning, you know, or sports performance. And it works really well because a lot of times they just hadn't, they, they've never seen themselves run, you know, except for in the football context, but they've never just seen themselves work out. And it's very interesting for them to see themselves. And um, the next point, the next question was touching on, you remind me again what the next, next part was t- talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're asking them for that feedback of how they're feeling on the moment, uh, like you say, the psychology, the emotional side, everything is, is tied into how they're going to feel on the, on the day and whether or not they're maybe you know, fit to, to run what you plan or if you have to pull them back. So how do you get them to stay aware of the, all those factors and how they feel mm. without making them think too much while they're sprinting? Oh, that's right. Okay. Yep. So really the biggest thing, I, a lot of times I try to give them really one to two, possibly three things to think about on any given day, like they could do a sprint. And I could be like, man, there were like 15 things wrong with that. <laughs> you know, like immediately seeing it, especially going back and like get the slow, slow motion video and, and all that. But to me, it's just, how can I focus on the most important thing right now? And sometimes I'm sure I'm incorrect on what the most important thing might be, but at least it's something that I see as a coach first, let's address just that. Cause I know that's an issue. Let, let's work on that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm really big on not over coaching because I've, in my private sector experience, I know that when I would hand hold these athletes through their preparation, they would never be able to do it if I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And I learned that lesson the hard way with, uh, I had one guy I was preparing for his NFL pro day. And it was when I was a younger coach and I was, I was hand holding him through everything. Like when you get set up in your 40 yard stance, do this, do that, do this, lift your hips to here. Okay. You know, just after every rep, okay, that was good. But X, Y, Z, you know, just constantly giving him things to work on and and which worked, uh, you know, you look at some of the motor control research in terms of what translates to performance. And a lot of times it's like, you can have a great practice coaching that way because you've, you've gotten them to do everything. You've micromanaged the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So you can have an awesome practice that way. So you'll see higher increases in, in practice performance earlier on, but then when they go to perform, they lose it because you're not there to hand hold them or hold their hand through the entire process. That's what happened with this guy is he went to go do his pro day. I couldn't go to the pro day and it was a disaster. You know, he just, he was in his own head. He was self-conscious. He had no idea what was going on. He was just like waiting for me to give him some instruction and I wasn't there. And so, you know, the other, the other thing in some of the uh, motor learning research is that if you, try to facilitate the learning more in terms of get asking them questions almost well how'd that feel to you you know what do you what do you think about what you just did then they start taking ownership of their own performance and then they're they're being given the permission to perform in a way that is unique to them but still sort of abiding by these these general boundaries which are basically general principles of biomechanics that are being facilitated from the from the coach or the director or whatever it might be and the motor learning research shows that you'll see a slower improvement in performance and practice that way, but more likely you will see an improved performance in the context of what's needed, like the game performance or the competitive performance will actually improve. And so for me, it's, I try to find that balance between the two of obviously part of my job is to be a coach here. And there's something about, you know, a coach's presence that, Team sport players are constantly trying to ask their coach, was that good? What would I do wrong? What can I fix? You know, or they're just expecting the coach to say it, whether or not they ask. So I've had multiple athletes say like, how was that? And I'll just be like, yeah, it was good. And like, that's about all I give them. You know, like do another rep. Let's see how it goes. You know? And then like after I might not even say much. And then afterwards it's like, so how'd that feel for you? What did you feel that might've been different from yesterday when we did this, you know? And that's something I, that I've seen, Stu at Altus coaches that way. And uh, I've seen a lot of coaches start to do that in some of these other disciplines. And um, I've seen great success that way, but I think that you need to be proficient at both. Sometimes you need to come in and say like, Hey, Hey, listen, like <laughs> what you're doing is a complete wreck. Like don't, don't do that. You know, that's, that's not good at all. And I usually do that when it's dangerous or just mm-hmm. clearly an aberration of biomechanics. You know, at that point I immediately step in and I say, Hey, listen, like that was, that's an unsafe position. Let's get you in a safer position, you know, but then 
once I know it's somewhat safe, I let them try to explore it a little bit. And that, that, that's my style. It's not everybody's style that's, that's around here, but, uh, or just around the field in general, but that, that's something that I've, I've, uh, seen good success trying to work both sides of the fence, but more often than not, if I can uh, lean towards allowing them to explore it for themselves, then that's what I'm going to do. Maybe not, you know, talking directly about the, 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 the pros because that's what they do full time. And I want to talk about video analysis a little bit. Do you, do you think that for maybe, you know, semi pros, amateur players that have access to, let's say, sports video analysis of their games in the context of football, of soccer, of, of rugby. Do you think it's a disservice in, in, that, in that, you know, the same frame as we were talking just before of, you know, spoon feeding them everything? Do you think we're doing them a disservice by make, doing the video analysis for them? Should, 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 would they get something out of it by going through the game themselves and watching their own performance and drawing their own conclusions on what they have to work on? I think so. I think there's going to be benefits to both. And, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I thought was great about the Altus need for speed course as it relates to the context of building team speed performance was they had this notion of here are the general rules and from there start to explore. And so I think it's a great just overarching principle for learning in general, because, uh, you know, if you, if an athlete goes to look at their film that is available to them and they just, they don't have the underlying general rules of what they should be looking for. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to get anything out of it. And I speak from experience when I say that, because, you know, when I was in, when I was playing college football, our coaches were like, get in the, get in the film room and watch film. That's all they said okay, great. I'm in the film room and I'm logging hours of watching film, but I don't really know. There's, there's 22 guys on the field and like, what am I looking for? And where, you know, where should I, where should I narrow my focus of attention? And I think that's where uh, coaches are helpful is because I think if, yeah, you should, I, I, I believe it shouldn't be completely spoon fed mm -hmm. because then they'll never take responsibility of their own development. Mm -hmm. And I think that whether it's, you know, mental, cognitive in terms of watching film and trying to understand and learn from that standpoint, or it's physical development. I, I always believe in trying to help the athlete develop the habit of taking ownership of their own performance. And we try to talk to our athletes here because Aaron Wallman came from the Giants and I worked with NFL athletes when I was at DeFranco's. And you, when you talk to these guys that last more than five years in the NFL, they're all very similarly minded guys, unless they're just a total freak athlete and then they're crazy at the same time, but they keep getting chances because they're that good. Um, but most of the guys that are truly like the, the professional professionals, if you will, like the true pros pro, uh, they have a lot of ownership over their own health, their own development. You know, they are the guys that will initiate Uh, what should I do to take care of my body? What should I do to learn the tactics of the game better? You know, it's it, like to a man, those were the guys that, that lasted the longest in these professional leagues that in my experience, and, and Aaron Wallman said the same thing about the guys he had on the giants, that they just developed these habits of trying to improve themselves and not necessarily be obsessive about it to the point of where it's a detriment now and taking away from, their life balance, but just understanding what they need to do in order to stay on the field, stay in the game, keep their job and continue their careers. And, and that's, that's such a, an important skill that I, I'm not sure gets talked enough about is just having that habitual skill, the skill of just developing positive habits. And that, that's something that's a major challenge and something that I'm really fascinated with now that I'm in this setting is learning how to help these players understand that notion so that they can not just be the best players they can be at, at Indiana university, but can they, can, can we continue to send more and more and more guys to the NFL from this program because they have those habits. And so far in that process, what have you found to be some of the keys to, you know, getting the guys to take ownership of their, their own progress, their own program and trying to, you know, develop within that themselves rather than you guys doing all the work for them? Well, I think a big thing is, is conversing with them. And, um, it's, it's just like coaching where if you're going to micromanage and talk down to, uh, 
anybody about something, they're going to probably pull away from it and, and resist it, you know? Um, and like I said, the difference here versus the private sector is the private sector, they are paying for every session. So they're already highly invested to be there because they're mm. literally investing their money to be there. Whereas here, it's just part of a schedule. Hey, you know, there's a lift tomorrow. Make sure you're there. If you're not there, you're going to be whatever reprimanded somehow, um, whatever it might be. And so there's already these, these societal walls that are put on these players of like, maybe they don't necessarily feel like showing up to do a workout and yet they're being asked to do that. So how do they deal with that situation? How do they deal with the fact that they know they have this homework assignment due, but we also have to do training. We have to do practice. They they're maybe they're injured. They need to get treatment rehab. Uh, you know, so all these hours start to build up for them, but so how are they managing that? And so it's just about trying to, converse with them that's that's what i've seen here so far because a lot of these kids just they have their own minds made up about certain things and nobody's asked them certain questions about like well have you thought about this you know whatever whatever this might be um have you thought of it this way instead of the way you're thinking about it just just i'm not telling you to be any different i'm just saying have you thought about this you know have you thought about instead of buying, you, know, you, you get some, you get some scholarship funding for food instead of using that for clothes. Have you thought about using it for maybe you get a rotisserie chicken, get some more protein in your body, <laughs> just things like that about like here, these are, these are professional uh, habit building principles that we've seen in our experience and, and just, you know, ha have you thought about it this way before? And so that those lead to really interesting conversations because that allows us to have a more honest conversation with our players and there's some that they haven't nailed. You know, they just, they do what they need to do. They show up, they, they, they get everything done and, and seemingly no problems. Some things, obviously, they will come up from time to time. But then there's others that it's a consistency thing with them where they're always lagging or they're always late or they're always late. So it's just about like, what is it about this person that they feel they always need to be late? You know, is it a defiance thing because of something that happened in their childhood and now they're just saying, nobody's going to tell me to be on time. You know, you just need to get to know the person and, and what they're all about. And so, yeah, that whole psychological side of things is I'm learning every day about that. Cause that's very different from the, the setting that I just came from. So I uh, don't have a great answer for you on that yet. As I get to know our team a little bit better than that's, that's so that'll be an answer that that comes out a little bit more complete. That'll be, that'll be perfect for uh, episode number two next year, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So we talked about the, the qualitative versus quantitative approach to speed development. So can you talk about speed testing? I mean, we see everything out there, and obviously it's going to vary from sport to sport. But let's take football as an example. Uh, we see people saying, oh, all you need is 10s and 20s because it's an acceleration sport. Then some people say, oh, no, you need fly 10s. Uh, some positions need fly 20s. So how might a coach who's not extremely well versed in you know speed development decide what speed tests to use with his team with his players in order to get valuable information that he can then use in his programming uh, and apply practically on the field with his athlete with his athletes yeah this is where i guess my experience in the private sector allowed me to see all of these different tests and so here obviously we're fortunate because we have a 1080 sprint and we can, we can get all kinds of information from that. So not just split times, but we can get force velocity profiles that are very in line with JB Marin's research and Pierre Samazino's research. And mm. so we can follow, follow that research and get comparable metrics to that. Uh, but for what I did for the longest time was, was really just using split times at, at DeFranco's. And I think that Ken Clark's research has been really great for team sport settings because he has shown uh some analyses that have specifically the paper that he studied was uh the nfl combine data and how the the manner in which most of the players accelerated there the vast majority of them accelerated in a similar fashion in terms of the way that they covered the 40 yards mm -hmm. and if you were to look at the speeds that they hit around that 40 yard mark and, and there's a lot of research to support the fact that team sport players start to hit their maximum speed around 30 meters, you know, around 30 to 40 meters. They're going to be close to their max speed, whereas track and field athletes will expand that a little bit further. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, that paper that Ken came out with showed that in a 40 yard setting around the 20 yard mark, almost all of them are going to be at least 90% of their max speed. So there's a lot of value there because um, he even talks about how Usain Bolt is over 90% of his maximum speed at 30 meters. So it's, it's fascinating how, you know, the world's fastest man is, is uh, even he is over 90% uh, at 30 meters. The difference is that he can, continue to very slowly accelerate further and further and further all the way up to 70 meters or whatever it is. But um, it makes sense, right? Where a sprinter needs to spread it out over a hundred meters. If they get there too early, then they only can decelerate from there. Cause once you're at maximum, you're there, you know, <laughs> that's as high as you're going to get and you can only get lower from there. So team sport athletes are different. They need to get there as soon as they can really uh, much faster so that they can go catch whoever they need to catch and go make a play. And most of the plays that are being made in team sports are within 30 meters when you really look at it. Obviously, in American football, you could have a an 80-yard kick return or something like that where there's a ton of distances being covered. But the vast majority of the game will be played within 30 meters, and most team sports are the same way. You know, burst in, in soccer or rugby will typically be in that same sort of setting. Um, so for me, the way I understood it was I said, okay, if I can get them around 90% at, you know, 15 to 20 yards, then I need to build them up to go at least that far. You know, so I started with just doing tens, but I realized that tens weren't enough. And I think a lot of coaches are, they stick around tens because tens are safe. You know, it's like a one to two second sprint and it's seemingly low risk because you don't approach any top speed environments. But once you get to that 20 yard mark, now athletes are starting to get more upright. They're starting to approach top speed mechanics and they're starting to approach top speed velocities uh, based on team sport, just trends and the way that, the way that they look. So I, I would do, I started by doing tens and I said, okay, well, I need to do at least twenties now. And then what I, what I started doing was just looking at how I was afraid to do fly tens until I felt like they were ready to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's because I tried fly tens before that. And I had guys pull hamstrings and pull quads and pull hips and groins and everything pull lower backs. I've seen, I've seen it all trying to do the flying tens. And that was, you know, that was reading the Charlie Francis and early sprint training, do flying sprints to improve your max velocity. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, let's, let's just do it then. Um, instead of realizing like I need to build this elastic endurance of sprint positioning. Like I need them to learn how to be upright, how to bounce off the ground for, for, you know, rep after rep, every step when you think about it's basically a rep. So I would, what in the private sector, what I would do is I would start with, measuring tens and twenties, you know, as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm utilizing drills that are not timed that are trying to reinforce the ability to run in the upright position in a way that has good front side lift, good bounce off the ground, not having excessive backside mechanics and like butt kicking out the back and all of that. So I was trying to build that upright technique while I was focusing on those early stages of, of acceleration. It's really a short to long approach. It's no different than that. And then when I would get to the longer approaches, I would then introduce um, some of those longer distance with a fly 10. So maybe it's only like a 10 yard sprint into a 10 yard, you know, the the timing gate is between the 10 and the 20. Mm -hmm. So there's only a 10 yard build up into that. Mm -hmm. So maybe I start there. And then as I feel more comfortable, I bump it to, I put it between the 20 and the 30. So now they have a 20 yard build up. And then I wouldn't go much, I don't think with anybody, I really went beyond doing a 30 to 40 segment yeah. just because with team sports i was like i just i don't know if i really need to take the risk of going much further than that so um i would introduce fly positioning that way and then i would use the fly as the intro to that next distance so for example if i had it between say i was timing just tens from a dead stop whether mm-hmm. it's two point or three point stance is it doesn't really matter from a static start it's always going to be a, it's always gonna be a lot more intense from a static start than it is from a rolling or flying start. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's say I'm just doing tens there and I want to, I know I want to get to doing a static start into a 20 yard sprint. Well, let me introduce the 20 yard distance with a fly 10 from a 10 yard buildup, mm. you know, so they would build up 10 and burst 10. Then I would progress it just 10 yards back for each one where I'd be right. testing a 20 yard from a static start and then between the 20 and 30 so I can prepare them for the 30 yard distance. And that's kind of how I did it for, for many years at DeFranco's when I didn't have access to a, a 1080 sprint or some of the more sophisticated 
even like the sophisticated iPhone apps that they have now, like the my sprint and, and some mm-hmm. of those, I just only using timing gates. That was the way that I did it. And I still got a ton of great information from that trying to figure out like, okay, this guy's able to build him his speed up to the 20, but then between the 20 and the 30, it starts to fall off. Well, if you, if you cross reference that with, you know, maybe a, an RSI test or something, well, he sucks at his RSI test too. Okay. Well, what does he look like when he runs upright? Well, that looks pretty bad as well. Okay. Well, he just has no elastic ability, so he's not going to mm-hmm. be good after 20 yards. You know, so you start painting pictures with these little tests that you can use. Right. No, that makes sense, man. We're, we're getting close to the hour, so I'm going to get on to the rapid fire questions, but the, I've definitely got a, a list of questions for next time we, we get a chance to chat. So just to end here on some, some short questions, uh, what's your favorite movie, Cam? My favorite movie? One, one of the movies that I think was perfectly written, and I'm sure people would disagree with me on this, is <laughs> um, the movie Whiplash about the drummer. I don't know if you've seen right. that movie. I have. I have. And, I thought it was great. And the way that it ended, and I was like, that was perfect. Like, I have, I have no, no critique of this movie at all. Like, I just thought it was great. So I think in terms of from start to finish, my favorite movie, that might be one of them for sure. Yeah, so, so for those who didn't, haven't watched it again, uh, so if I have, haven't watched it yet, go watch it. And for those who didn't like it, go watch it again, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Work out with or without music? I can go either way. It doesn't matter to me. I could hit a PR without music or, or with music. It's fun with music, but I don't need it. Good man. Uh, what's your favorite non-training book? Ooh, um, that's a tough one. I think one that really spoke to me that's a non-training book, but still ties into our professional a little bit was, uh, was Extreme Ownership from Jocko Willink and, yeah. and, and Leif Babin. And so that one just, that just changed my mind about how I think about how people should interact from a leadership standpoint with people that they're leading. So that was a, that was a big one for me. If you could change one thing in the sports performance world right now, what would it be? I would wave a magic wand and eliminate all the egos that exist. Yeah. <laughs> I would just want all, I would just want all of us to sit down and just be, be real and be upfront and be honest and just say like, Hey, listen, mate, I'm not that great of a coach all the time. I make a ton of mistakes and it's okay because I'm just trying to learn from them. Like I wish we could all just, just do that. And I wish I did that when I was younger and I'm grateful that I do that now. <laughs> So that's what, that's one piece of advice. What's one more piece of advice for the coaches uh, listening to you that you can put forward from all your experience? Uh, Don't, don't ever lose your coach's eye with all of this education that's out there. Now, everybody wants to read the books and read the science and understand the data. And I will support all of that full heartedly, but uh, do not ever lose sight of what's right in front of your face and what you can see and that interpersonal connection in this world that, you know, is getting more and more isolated with the increase in technology and, and whatever else that's a deep rabbit hole. We could dive down if you wanted, but it, it, it's to me, I just think pay attention to people in front of you, talk to the people in front of you and listen to them. Don't just wait for them to stop talking so that you can say your piece. You know, that, that, that's probably my the big lesson that I've learned really in the last two years. I think that's a, that's a very good point to bring up. Cam, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Where can people find you on social if they want to follow you? So, yeah, social media, I only have Twitter. Uh, and the Twitter handle is at IU Coach Joss. So IU just stands for Indiana University. Mm-hmm. So that's where I put all of my social media information is on there. And um, if anybody wants to chat, they can send a direct message through that or communicate that way. Um, or they can reach out through my work email, which is cjoss at iu.edu. I'll definitely link your Twitter profile in the podcast description. It was a great pleasure to have you on today, Cam. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate the time, man. It was great. Take care.